Hi, everyone. Welcome to Design for Accessibility. My name is Amy Pinder, and I am the Executive Director of Accessible Festivals. As I said, I'm the Executive Director of Accessible Festivals. Um, I think important to note, I'm also a speech language therapist who works with individuals with all different types of disabilities. And it's been a big part of my life purpose to not only help others make adjustments to the way that they communicate and interact with the world, but also to you know, impart to the rest of the world that you know, there's adjustments we can all make to make the world more accessible and inclusive. So Accessible Festivals um, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to ensuring that music and other forms of recreation are accessible to all abilities through education and events. We produce our own events and we also work with creators of other events to help to make their events more accessible through consultation and training and, and direct services. Um, another big focus area of ours is educating the general public about the value and the meaning of inclusion. Um, I'll talk more about that in a bit, but by creating spaces where everyone feels welcome, we can learn so much. And that is, to me, the true meaning of inclusion is places where everyone is welcome. Our mission is to make music and other forms of recreation accessible for all people of all ages and all abilities. Um, we do that by fostering connection and understanding through the universal language of music and providing a platform where people of all abilities and identities can connect and build relationships and doing this in an event space, particularly a festival space where the vibes, the, the energy tends to be really warm and welcoming that can, you know, I think have a ripple effect that goes far beyond the festival grounds. And it can hopefully inspire the creation of safe and inclusive and equitable communities. Um, music, I think, is particularly powerful. It's why it's one of our core focuses, because it's something that everyone can connect to. It transcends so many different types of disabilities and limitations. So by sticking around and participating in this workshop today, you're going to be able to uh, really understand a little bit more about why accessible, inclusive events benefit everyone, not just people with disabilities. And you'll be able to explain access and inclusion, what those words really mean, and get an understanding of the basic requirements of the ADA laws, that's the American with Disabilities Act, as well as accommodations that exceed the ADA laws and really go, you know, the extra mile, so to speak, to make everyone at an event feel fully welcome and able to enjoy the experience. So first, why? Why should we create accessible events? Um, number one is safety. Um, accessible events are safer for everyone. Um, Things like clear signage and detailed information about what to expect ahead of the event and at the event, helpful resources, um, all of these things make the event safer and easier for anyone to enjoy. And I think, you know, it also is worth noting that disabilities can happen at any moment. Um, we might experience even a big feeling, a mental health issue um, at an event, we might experience an injury or we might come to an event with an existing disability and um, knowing what to expect, having knowing where to go to get help um, and being able to read signs and, and other pieces of information are, are really, really crucial for everyone. Um, Accessible events are, are good for business. Um, increasing attendance and revenue is definitely a side effect of creating more accessible events. There's over 50 million people with disabilities in the United States. There's a huge opportunity to serve a demographic that largely, like anybody, really wants to connect and wants to go out and be able to do things that allow them to enjoy life and connect with other people. Um, so, it's good for business and and businesses and organizations that take measures to make their their events and their spaces more accessible usually do see increases in their revenue um, and in the the number of people that they're able to to reach. 
Um, it, of course, limits legal liability. We'll get into that a little bit later. It is legally required to follow ADA laws, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. But um, it's, it's definitely a good thing to limit your legal liability by doing the right thing. Um, it's good for public relations. It's a great story to tell about the measures that you've taken and to create a space where everyone feels welcome. And it also helps with removing the stigma that exists from having a disability and kind of normalizes this idea of creating spaces where anyone can fully participate wherever they want to be. And as I mentioned, it's, it's really just, it's the right thing to do. So a little bit more about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, an excerpt from that states that a public accommodation shall afford goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations to an individual with a disability in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of the individual. So long and short, a person with a disability should be able to access or participate in anything that they want to be a part of, and they should be able to do that reasonably just as easily as anyone else. Um, I think of interest, the American with Disabilities Act is still fairly new. Um, it was only passed in 1990, so there's still a lot to, um, there's still a lot left to interpretation, and um, it was based on legislature from the civil rights movement, and in this era, um, you know, there's there's a lot to you know kind of discuss and figure out how this applies to the virtual spaces that we're all increasingly a part of. But it does, in fact, apply, and it's very important to know that you are legally required to to welcome and accommodate people with disabilities in the events and spaces that you create. So, what is real accessibility? Um, Literally, accessibility is the provision of reasonable accommodations that enable an individual with a disability to conveniently and equitably access physical structures, environments, programs, goods and services, and so many more places. They should be able to access recreational and social and vocational, academic and commercial spaces. Um, and there's a lot of places that have accessibility barriers. Um, so if you want you to kind of play along with me here, if you want to type into the chat a place that you think might have an accessibility barrier, you can go ahead and do that. Um, any place that you think might present a challenge with someone of, with any, any disability type. Um, so whether you're thinking it or typed it, the chances are whatever you typed or thought was probably right. Um, accessibility barriers except exist in many, many settings. And in, in many cases, places that state that they're accessible still have accessibility limitations. Um, I, I read a really um, great article from Vice lately about um, accessible music venues and firsthand accounts from people with disabilities um, expressed experiences like reading that the show that they were going to attend was accessible and they were indeed able to get through the door, but once they arrived, they weren't able to access the bathroom. So things like that can and do happen. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about inclusion. What is real inclusion? Um, it is the practice of integrating and bringing together all individuals, regardless of ability, allowing them to fully participate and be valued equally within all places, their communities and neighborhoods and workplaces and classrooms, and of course, the social and recreational environments that we're talking about reconvening to here today. Um, so let's see, I wanted to look at your chat really quickly before I move on from, from this topic. Um, yeah, water slide parks and the beach, theme parks, old venues, historic buildings. Those are all great responses. Nature centers. Um, there's, 
yeah, there's there's a variety of places that are harder to access, and there's solutions. Um, and if we work together, we can we can make more and more um, events and places more accessible. Virtual events do require accessible websites. Yes, that's true. Um, we're going to talk more about that. So I'm going to move on. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our journey, Accessible Festival's journey, and um, starting with pre-COVID, what we were up to and how our business model has had to change. And um, I'm a very optimistic person. So uh, my experience has been that although there was lots and lots of challenges to the way that we had to change, there's also a lot of opportunities. And we learned a lot from the shifts that we've had to make over the last year. So. Accessible Festivals was founded in 2014, and Accessible Festivals was founded because um, our founder was in a car accident that resulted in him becoming paralyzed from the waist down. And going to a music festival is an experience that made him feel really welcome and hopeful for the first time in a long time. So Austin Whitney, the founder of Accessible Festivals, he inspired by that experience, he got to work and he partnered with music festivals across the country. And he created, you know, with a wonderful, amazing teams, he, he was instrumental in creating some of the most successful and comprehensive event accessibility programs in the country. So that was the work of accessible festivals pre COVID. And since 2014 was really advocating for what accessibility could look like on the ground at a festival and now it's really become a prominent aspect of any large scale event operation. So this short video is going to give you a picture of what accessibility looks like at um, or looked like at Coachella Music and Arts Festival spearheaded by Austin's team.
So we worked with lots of other festivals and eventually decided to create our own music and wellness festival. Um, and in, in true pandemic fashion in 2020, we had to take our own festival that we produce called Inclusion Festival, and we had to figure out how to do that online. So um, in 2020, um, after the pandemic hit, we produced our first online music festival. We called it Inclusion Festival Online. Previously, Inclusion Festival took place in person. It was in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania. And it was, as far as we know, it was the first fully accessible festival like designed at its core to be that. Um, in the United States, we've um, we've partnered or talked with other festivals that have similar ideas and missions in other parts of the world, like the United Kingdom and Canada. Um, but we created a, a festival that was sensory friendly, um, unique to the needs of people with autism and other sensory processing challenges. And and we tried to take into account all different types of disability types and create a space that was really welcoming. So. We had to figure out how to move that concept online. Um, and remember, I mentioned part of our vision isn't just to provide something that's accessible to people with disabilities, but also to educate the general public about the value of doing that. So COVID-19 has highlighted the need to promote best practices in virtual accessibility and also to try some new things and to figure out exactly what that looks like as it's so new for everyone. So. That's what we've been up to um, in, in 2020. We presented Inclusion Festival online with accessibility features to support a diverse range of abilities. And um, it was harder. It was a lot harder, I thought, than um, producing an in-person festival. And I think that that largely had to do with us trying to take the in-person experience and to mirror that and to put the same experience online. And we realized that it's just, it's just not quite the same. There's a different way to connect online and there's a huge advantage that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about to connecting online, but it's, it's very different from a real life experience and in-person experience. And um, we learned a lot trying to translate it and then realizing the kinds of adjustments that we could make to really use the best of both worlds. So, the future um, after COVID, um, I, I think, is really in the continuation of live streams and in hybrid events. So event participants who are disabled benefit from a variety of access options, and that includes the continuation of live streams, which, as I'm sure you know, have been widely embraced and have really been wonderfully used throughout the pandemic. Um, it also presents an opportunity for creators to really improve their accessibility practices. So there's there's a lot of learning that I think can happen in this moment. And one huge takeaway for us is the continuation of live streams and the, the need to present things um, online as well as in person. There's always going to be accessibility challenges for different types of people, whether that's a physical barrier or there's all different types of accessibility. It could be an economic barrier, a geographic barrier, a family who has a lot of kids might not be able to get to a show that they'd like to see. Um, travel might not be possible. And yeah, so um, it's it's a really accessible way to, to present an experience and it's a way to reach a lot more people. So we, you know, at a t when we first started producing our own festival, we thought of it as a local festival. And now we have to think about it as potentially a global opportunity. And we have had participants, you know, at least span the country and even different parts of the world. We had participants from Bosnia, um, for example. And now it's figuring out how to integrate that and to use the accessibility of the online experience to reach the most people who want to be connected in this way. So recently, really recently, actually, just last month, we, for the first time, tried our own hybrid event, um, not a full festival, but we called it Inclusion Dining and Jams. It was an inclusive dinner and a show experience, and it had a lot of accessibility features like American Sign Language and captions and some other elements. And there's another quick video overview highlighting what that looked like.
and she eases up my mind. Good things and sunshine all the time. I want to one more time for Jules Harrison who opened up the evening. I want to bring him up here and do a tune right now. And I guess that's why they call it the blues. I want to sing the song, but I want to watch the show too, so it's kind of hard. That's amazing. Hippopotamus. Encyclopedia. Wow. He is of average height with a really cool hat and an amazing blue button down shirt. The speckled, sparkled. Lapel jacket. You need some privacy. I'll walk myself outside and count to ten. Yeah, let's count to ten. All right. We're going to do another yoga jam, and that means you're just going to move your body in any way that feels good. Don't worry. Can you keep singing that part? I can't wait. For you to take it I can't, I can't wait For you to take it Make a little bit easier now Stretch my limbs into wings Into wings Into wings Stretch my limbs Into wings Into wings Stretch my limbs in two ways. Thanks for watching and the kind comments. Um, we were really, really proud of how we integrated so many things that we try to promote um, at our festival that we think are a part of accessibility and inclusion and wellness. You might have noticed some traditional accessibility features, but also some things like the elements of playful mindfulness and audience participation, which are, um, you know, some things that go beyond the ADA and are just ways to make everyone feel welcome. Um, so I saw one question. If you have a question, please type it into the question and A portion, and I'm going to get to those at the end. So Tara, if you can put your question there, that way I'll definitely be able to answer it. Um, uh, so you just saw some examples of accessibility features. I want to make sure we spend lots of time focusing on creating an accessibility program. So in real life, in in-person experiences, this means things that you saw in the first video, like accessible parking and pathways and restrooms, um, coming up with a plan for accessible venue transportation, like the use of shuttles, um, the need to continue di consider dietary accommodations. That means letting people bring their own food or making sure that a variety of dietary accommodations can be accommodated at your event through the vendors that you have there. Um, policies about service animals. You actually can't ask if an animal is a service animal. You can't ask to see proof of that, but um, can come up with policies and procedures around allowing that and communicating clearly with that. Um, viewing platforms, access centers, which are like information and service hubs that you can set up. They're very um, commonplace at larger events, but we do them at smaller events too. And they're really helpful places where people can come to just ask questions. You can kind of like combine a, a traditional information booth with a place that people know that they can also go and get any kind of help that they need or any access needs that they have met and figured out. Um, assistive listening devices um, should be available at large scale events. The absence of strobes and fast changing lights is important. Um, seating options away from crowds is really important for people who might be experiencing anxiety or sensory processing issues. And it's also really important to include accessibility in emergency plans. So what is the plan going to be for wheelchair users, for instance, to exit the site if that needs to happen, which hopefully it never does. Um, and yeah, I saw a comment I like about diverse learning styles. It is really important to remember diverse learning styles and even beyond learning in recreational spaces, just how people receive and experience things. So um, 
I think that's where things like limiting the the use of strobe lights and providing options that give people a place to get away and then get back to an event um, are really, really helpful. There's also a lot of things that apply to both in real life and virtual situations. These are things like having an accessible website that is WCAG 2.0 compliance. Um, lots more to learn about that. There's a handout available to you that has a really nice resource on that. Um, developing a comprehensive access guide. So just you know, having a section of your website um, that tells people what to expect and what kinds of accessibility features you will have is um, really, really helpful. And then giving them options to get in touch if they have more questions. Um, in both cases, effective communication options, some of which you saw on the last video, like closed captioning, having transcripts available if it's spoken content, um, American Sign Language interpreters, audio descriptions during the event. That means having someone available to kind of describe the scene, to describe the information that someone who is blind or has low vision would miss. Um, with their eyes and that can be described instead. So yes, I, the difference between captioning and audio descriptions, captioning just provides a written account of what is being said verbally, but audio descriptions provide information about what you can't hear or see um, necessarily. So for example, um, audio descriptions would describe what someone was wearing or what someone looked like or the size of the crowd or the way that dancers were moving their bodies on a stage. Those are audio descriptions versus captions. And image descriptions are really similar. They describe what's going on in a scene, in an image. More online considerations. It's important to ensure that all your web text is easy to read, that sans serif fonts are typically a lot easier for people to read. Um, provide large buttons with plenty of space between buttons for users with mobility and vision issues. Um, bright colors are really helpful too. Ensure the website is accessible via keyboard. Um, provide image descriptions like we just touched on. I'm gonna give an example of that in a moment. Caption your videos and provide transcripts of spoken content. So for example, if you produce a podcast, providing a transcript of that is very accessible. Um, when buying tickets online, um, ticket timeouts can be really limiting to people with disabilities. So you can either avoid those altogether or extend your ticket purchase time limit. Um, also provide a clear accessibility statement on your website and provide direct contact, contact information for further questions. Um, a few other things, CAPTCHA is not accessible for people with low vision and um, language really matters. So use descriptive link text like buy tickets now versus click here to help people understand exactly what's expected. This is an example of an image description. So Take a look at the photo here and you might describe it by saying, two men stand in front of a white tent at a music festival. The tent is occupied by two women working and has a blue sign that reads ADA Access Center. The men are dressed in patriotic attire. One has a green cast on his right leg. Oh, you can't see that, but it's there. And both men are smiling and holding up a single crutch. COVID, of course, brings up some unique considerations that we didn't need to think about before. So um, we're all thinking about getting back to live events slowly but surely. So screening questions could exclude people with COVID systems. These are kind of questions to ask yourself. Could screening questions meant to exclude those with COVID symptoms also exclude those with other disabilities who are not a threat to the public? Also, what supports will you offer to those who need assistance with screening questions? And consider providing COVID screenings at a dedicated alternate ADA entrance point if you can. That would make it a lot easier and more manageable for the people who might have a lot of questions and concerns related to COVID screenings and a disability that they may have. Um, Really importantly, I think, is to clearly convey COVID protocols and contact information. So that can be listed on multiple parts of your website. Maybe you have a COVID section and an accessibility section. It would be really helpful to have that written in both places. 
Um, I'm going to get to questions soon. I'll get to as many as I can. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do on your own to make your events more accessible. Um, but if you need more help, there's a really great company called 1050 Entertainment that was created by the founder of Accessible Festivals, who I mentioned before, Austin Win Whitney. Um, things that I think you can do fairly easily on your own is are some of the website suggestions that I made, making sure your layouts are really accessible and those kinds of things, creating an access guide um, so that people know what features you'll have and what to expect when they get to your event. And learning how to do image and audio descriptions is also something um, that you can probably figure out how to do internally or with some consultation and help. Things that you really need to budget for include things like closed captioning and ASL and also the infrastructure that you might need to modify to make an accessible space. Um, there's some tools that'll caption for you. Some are better than others, um, depending on what you're doing. But if it's a live event, um, there's live captioners that can be there and, and caption what's being said. Um, another note on infrastructure, if you select a venue that already is accessible, that, that's a huge win. So you can look for accessibility in the layout of a space that you're, you're considering or that you're choosing. Um, next, I want to touch on going beyond the ADA and creating full and equal enjoyment for, for all people. Um, event creators need to consider more than accessible entryways and layouts and ramps and elevators and restrooms and so many of the things we touched on today. Um, a truly inclusive event also provides an accessible website and registration process, accessible information guides, and really importantly, a welcoming atmosphere with well-trained staff who understand disability etiquette. So we we try to do all the things at our events and we do them better and better each time. Um, but you know, my personal takeaway from doing this is it's never someone that comes up and says like, that was a really great ramp. <laughs> you know, people come up and say like the way that I felt when I was here was unlike the way I felt at any other event. So the way you welcome people, it's it's not the only thing. It's it's not required by the ADA. It goes beyond the ADA. You have to do all the ADA things in order to be legally compliant as an event creator. But going beyond the ADA is really just this basic human thing of making people feel welcome and feel like their needs are going to be met when they come to your event. And so that's something you can't really replace, you know, with a with infrastructure. Um So just going to leave you with a, a few thoughts before I get to, to questions. 57 million Americans have a disability. Of those, only 20% have a disability that's visible. So that means that 20% of people with disabilities, for them, it's hidden. So it's not something that you can see. So part of creating that welcoming atmosphere is, you know, trying not to judge at all and to just, you know, accept whatever it is that a person is asking for. It's it's not our place to make a judgment about what's being requested. It's just our place to, to be as helpful as we can because people might make a request that seems strange to you or act in a way that seems strange, but all we can do is do our best to, to help. Here's some general disability etiquette. Um, presume competence in all people, avoid judgments and assumptions, Think before you speak. Ask if you're unsure. It's always okay to ask. Um, recognize signs of anxiety and, you know, kind of try to stay calm yourself. Use clear, concise language. Be patient, respectful, and friendly. Speak directly to individuals, not about them. That's part of presuming competence. They can understand you. Um, stay positive and flexible and use mindful language. Um, some people prefer person first language and some people prefer identity first language. So that's a person with autism versus an autistic person, for example. And that's one of those things that you can ask because everyone has a different preference. So we, we believe that recreation is critical to human health and happiness. We all, you know, 
are happier and our lives are so much richer when we take time to find ways to play, even as adults. So if you want, you can type some of those ways into the chat. One example of that um, at one of our in-person inclusion festivals, bonding through group yoga. And we also believe that when diverse voices are part of the conversations that take place in recreational spaces, all of society benefits. And music is the universal language of humankind. It transcends so many boundaries. So including music and in events is um, really unifying. And lastly, the future of accessible music definitely includes live streams. So really think of, I encourage everyone here to think about the hybrid model and how you can utilize what we've learned throughout this past year about online programming and, and include it as you return to, to in-person programming. Thanks. You can join our ma mailing list at accessiblefestivals.org and you can send me an email if you have any further questions. Right now, I am going to do my best to address as many questions as I can from the question tab. So first I was asked, are there any tech tips you have for producing an accessibility focused event? Are there any apps that we use? Um, Find a team that really fits your needs. There's so many different choices out there. And for us, it's been some trial and error finding different teams and different groups that can provide um, things like live captioning and finding the one that best meets our needs. So um, I don't have any specific resource, um, but it's there, there's, there's lots of different companies and finding one that's best for you is important. Um, is it appropriate to advertise prior to your event the specific means of accessibility? Would doing so promote attendance by people who otherwise might never consider attending? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I think that that is a great thing to do. Um, that's something that we do. And if you don't tell people that the event's accessible, you know, they're, they're going to be less likely to come. So being front facing and forward with the accommodations that you have in place is really an important way of getting more people there and making people feel welcome and like they're going to be cared for at the event. So yes, advertise. Um, best practices or resources on how to educate and train staff. Um, yes. Absolutely. That's actually we have some, we have a training that we do on that. So that can be done in person or online, depending on physical boundaries and logistics. So you're welcome to reach out and get in touch about a staff training that we can provide um, about that. And there's some additional resources, reading resources that cover some of those topics in the handout. So be sure to download that. Um, Ooh, have I felt a cultural shift in regards to getting event planners to care about accessibility and work, give resources to create open access in recent years? If so, what do you think contributed to this? Um, yeah, I think that things are always improving. And I think that particularly over this past year, um, COVID has really highlighted the need to make everything more accessible and to think about things in different ways so that people can do the things that they want to be doing, but again, in a different way. So for example, when, when this pandemic began, we had to virtually shift the way that we work overnight. Professionals, most professionals were all of a sudden permitted, required to work from home. And for example, people with disabilities, um, might also really benefit from working from home, not because of COVID considerations, but because working from, from home might be a more comfortable place to work um, without having to worry about getting dressed or wearing clothing that's appropriate without having to deal with some of the things that might be uh, difficult about an office environment, for example. So um, I, think that, I think that in particular this past year, um, realizing that so many people are capable from work, working from home and connecting from home, uh, working and in, engaging in recreational opportunities has shifted a lot of perspectives about what's possible and about how to include people and let people work and contribute and participate in ways that really suit their individual needs. Um, 
I got a question about the event that we produced last month was a hybrid event. Yes, it was in person. Um, people that were local to the the area that that I'm in, that's Beth, um, Pencil, it was in Pennsylvania. I live in New Jersey. We're able to come to the cafe that it took place at and and, and participate in person, but it was also live streamed to, to anyone everywhere. Um, and like I've been saying, I really think that that's an important consideration and that we should continue producing hybrid events because they're more accessible. Um, Oh, I like this one about, it says, in an in-person conference, for instance, would audio description person be on stage with the main speaker? Logistically, can you walk through how this looks at an in-person event? So I learned a lot about audio descriptions um, fairly recently, and that's because audio descriptions aren't typically provided um, the way that we provided them at the event that we just tried. Like I said, we're, we've been trying new things. So... That's because music is a really auditory experience. So typically audio descriptions aren't seen as necessary because you can just listen. But I think that there's so much more that goes on around a live music experience that could be missed. So we tried kind of integrating it into our event and kind of making the audio descriptions feel like hosting. But Calvin, to better answer your question, traditionally audio descriptions are provided discreetly. So someone who needs them would receive a headset and then an audio describer would be on site and able to fill in visual gaps in information directly to that person. That's something that happens at theaters, for instance, and dance performances are good examples of where you might, you know, see that really readily. Um, but at a conference, you might kind of like we tried, you might be able to, to build it right in and just be more mindful about the kind of language that you use when when introducing a speaker or introducing, um, you know, a workshop, whatever is going to be happening um, within the main event and describing that in a way that helps someone create a picture in their mind. So it, it might be something you could work in the hosting like we did. And a little more from you, how detailed to get for image descriptions. That's kind of a matter of preference. Like a lot of details is helpful, but too many could be overwhelming. So I like to just kind of think about how to create a picture in someone's mind um, because they can't see the picture. So what, what would be useful? Um, some mention of colors. Yeah, height. You mentioned height. Um, but there's there's no real rule of thumb. Everyone does them a little differently, but the point is helping someone make a picture in their mind. Um, I think that that is, you can find, oh, where can you find interpreters for hire? Um, in your local area, you can, you can reach out to disability service organizations who might have compiled resources as a starting point. But I mean, honestly, you can just Google it and you can, you can find an interview. Like I said before, the services that best meet your needs. So um, for our event recently, we worked with another nonprofit because we're a nonprofit. That was a really great fit for our ASL services. So um that is all that we have time for. I'm really, really thankful that all of you joined and shared your thoughts and your questions. Um, the handout should be in the handout tab. Um, so if you just scroll over, you'll see chat, Q&A, polls, and handouts. If you click there, you'll be able to get a little bit more information as a follow-up to this conversation. And um, remember, you can reach out to me, um, amy at accessiblefestivals.org. Sign up for our mailing list accessible at accessiblefestivals.org. I'd love to stay connected and thank you.